difficult crowd. <laughs> now, channeling my inner Holly Willoughby, how are you? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm surprisingly good, actually. Um, yeah. Although this is the first interview of this nature I've done um, since I stepped down as First Minister, so I might be a bit out of practice. My Excellent. And I woke up this morning thinking, why on earth am I doing this? And then I thought, because Ian asked me really nicely. Um, and, you know, I, I still, although I'm no longer First Minister, I am trying to have a bit more of a, a quiet, private life. Uh, every single day, um, things are said about me, things uh, are said about what I do, what I think, what I say. Every now and again, it's nice to have some of that in my own words. So that's what it's about. I asked you to, I invited you to do this back. I looked, I checked this morning, uh, February the 22nd. A lot has happened since then. It's an understatement. Uh, that is an understatement. And I've been paranoid that you might decide, well, I'm not sure this is a good idea. So I did line up a replacement if you decided to do that. <laughs> Giles Brandreth. Because <laughs> I, I reckon that a lot of you would quite like to see him anyway and you wouldn't yeah. demand your money back. But yeah. why are you doing this? Well, as, as I say, I, I, don't, I haven't done anything like this for you know, months now and I don't intend to do many interviews of this nature. Would I announce my decision to step down, you know, after a lot of agonising, what I said then I meant, you know, I've been in frontline politics for all of my adult life, um, I'm not complaining about that, I've had amazing opportunities, but you sacrifice a lot in your family life, your private life, you know, you can't go anywhere without, you know, security and people looking at you, photographing you, and I, I'm, I'm 53, I know that's hard to believe, but I am 53, and for the next stage of my life I hope to, you know, have a, a different uh, balance to that, um, so I'm not going to do a lot of this kind of stuff, but I'm also realistic enough to know that it was never going to happen that I could stand down one day and people would just forget about me the next, so what I said a moment ago, there's not a day goes by when uh, I don't read, or I don't actually read much of it anymore, but there isn't commentary in the, the media about me, about you know, the things I'm doing, have done, people speculating on what I think about things. So every now and again, I'm not going to disappear, I'm not going to stay silent. I will, every now and again, choose to talk in my own voice and have my own words out there as opposed to other people's words, pretending they know who I am and what I think. Um, so that's why I'm doing it. Apart from the fact I like you for all, you know, your, your dodgy politics on some things. I like you. <laughs> I'll admit that. Um, on this stage last year, I asked you about, so well, look, you've, you've been First Minister for however many years it was at that point, not expecting you to announce that you would be stepping down on, on this stage. But your answer did kind of make me think that it, it was going to be it sooner is. rather than later. Um, was it in your mind at that time? Um, it, it possibly was somewhere in my subconscious, but this time last year, was it in my mind? Was I thinking, planning to stand out? Absolutely, emphatically not. And actually, until, and even now, I, I find it hard to really pinpoint the moment where I started to think about it seriously and then enter a decision-making process that culminated in, in the announcement I made but it must have been around the turn of the year or, or thereabouts. Um, and every moment until then, when I was asked the question, and I was asked the question frequently, you know, are you about to step down, are you about to quit the stage? And I would say, no, absolutely not. I did a, an interview with Laura Kinsberg at the start of the year, and it was, I think it was just around the time Jacinda Ardern announced that she was standing down, and, and Laura asked me the question and I said, Emphatically, no, there's still plenty in the tank. And at that point, I meant it. I wasn't pretending. And every time I was asked the question and gave that answer, I meant it until suddenly one day I didn't anymore. And, and I always thought, you know, when I got to that stage, I would rather have the courage, I didn't know whether I would, I'd rather have the courage to step back at that point. When I felt I didn't have, I've, everything I've ever done in my life, I've tried to give 100% and more, if that's possible, to it. And when I got to the stage where I felt I couldn't do that anymore, I'd rather have the courage to step back at that stage rather than to go on and on and on until everybody's going, why in the earth are you still there? Um, so that's What happened basically. in those two months? Because it was only two no. months. I, I don't know what happened. That's why I, I think somewhere in my subconscious, for longer than that, I must have been wrestling with this. I'd been First Minister for eight years. Um, I've been... You know, I've got a 17-year-old niece and a 17-year-old nephew. Um, they 
they were less than a year old when I entered government. They're now, they're both learning to drive now, as am I, slightly older than they are. Um, How's that going? Uh, good, thanks. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't knocked anybody down yet. I, I, and you've even taxed your car now. <sighs> Don't start me. Don't start me. Um, yeah, it's an electric car, it's not due any tax, but anyway, that's another matter. And it's not my car. <laughs> Don't start me. Okay. Um, <laughs> where, where was I? Why did I? So, yeah, and you know, I've, I've been doing politics since I was pretty much 18 years old. and. For all my life, I've been Nicola the politician, and I don't know, I just want to spend a bit of my life being Nicola the person. I, I sometimes wonder, do I really know who that is? And that's what I want to spend a bit of time finding out. So at what point did that become upper most in my mind? I can't pinpoint it, but it was clearly working away. I do remember, actually, I'm not comparing the two of us, incidentally, before I say this, but I remember waking up the morning that Jacinda Ardern did make her announcement. And what struck me that morning was that my overwhelming emotion was envy. And I thought to myself, why is that? I, I sat listening to uh, her on the television thinking, ah, I wish that was me. And maybe that was the point I started to think, yeah. why am I feeling like that? And if I'm feeling like that, maybe I should think about this a bit more. It is interesting though, because I've always said, I've been doing my radio show now for 13 years, and I've always thought to myself, well, I'll know when I want to stop, mm -hmm. because I won't look forward to the next show. And it, it's, it's a little bit the same, I, I suppose. And it's a very human thing, isn't it? To understand when you need to get out, and it's better to get out I So it is a human thing. I, I think what's not so human um, is to admit it. And you know, obviously you're very aware of that in your own context, but I, I think perhaps there is a gender thing here as well. I think maybe women are just a bit more likely to not just recognise that, but, but admit it and say it. There's just, for me, and I'm only speaking personally here, there's just something about the nature of the last few years. You know, eight years as, as First Minister in that kind of job is a long time in normal circumstances, but of course, in the middle of that, or towards the end of that, was the two years of COVID. And that, those two years, for everybody, but again, speaking personally, probably felt, you know, three times the length of that. That was such a difficult, emotional, emotive, you know, experience for, for everybody, but in the position I was in, that I think that probably had an impact as well on my longevity and my, my own perception of my longevity. Now, when we all became aware of the police investigation, mm. people naturally, I think in some ways, drew a lot of conclusions mm -hmm. from that. Well, that must be the reason that she stood down. She must have got wind of it. Because it would have been, I mean, it was pretty traumatic for you, and we'll come on to that in a second, at the time. But if you had still been First Minister when that was going on, I, I mean, I think that would have been even worse. So can you categorically 100% say that you did not have any hint at all that this was happening? Categorically, 100% looking you directly. Yeah, and yeah. I've said that before. Look, the police investigation, of course I knew about it. Everybody knew about it. It had been underway for two years. Um, so I was aware of that. I had no idea of what was about to unfold. And what I'd say, think about me, think of me, what you want. Um, this is often the most controversial thing you ever, a politician ever says on a platform like this. We are human. Um, you know, if I had any idea about what was going to unfold, I announced I was stepping down mid-February. I stood down six weeks or so later. If I had any idea, I wouldn't have been able to function in, in that period. So, no, categorically not. Just take us through what happened. I mean, we all remember, we all read about it, we saw the pictures. I mean, uh, to this day. I, I'm not going to take you through what happened in that because it wouldn't be appropriate to do that when the investigation is still No, but you could, when, when, when did you first realise that it, that it was happening? That it was when it starting? was happening. So literally the knock on the door. Yeah, well, I'm not going to, yes, but I'm not going to go any further into that. Um, maybe one day I'll be able to, but that day's not now. You're saving it for the memoirs. <laughs> no, um, I am writing a memoir, yes, but um, I'm not uh, necessary. And, and you know, I always said, well, ever since I was a wee girl, I've, I've had this, I've always loved books, and I've had this ambition to write a book. I've never known whether I, I would. And 
the last few years I've always thought when I eventually am out of this job, I will write, you know, I always think memoir is too grand a term, but I will write it all down for therapy apart from anything else. Um, and I've started that process and it is proving to be very therapeutic. So I, I intend to cover all of the, the key events you know, that I've lived through, that I've experienced, that I've been part of. And of course, you know, that will include more recent things as well as things you know, further back in the past. Um, and then we'll see if anybody wants to read it. But, can, so this is one of those things where I, I'm going to ask you a question which I think you could answer, but whether you will or not, I don't know. The, on that day when the police came to your house, erected that tent, I mean, it was almost as if it was a Brookside moment. They were looking for a body somewhere. I mean, that's how... You're older than me. You, you obviously have these cultural <laughs> references. I said, that, that's, that's an unfair comment. I love Brookside. <laughs> Trevor George, George Ash. Um, but it, it was uh, completely over the top. I think even your bitterest enemies could see that it didn't warrant that level of sort of operation. Look, I... In this, and this is all I'm going to say about it, it's obviously been a, a really difficult, you know, traumatic experience. You know, people live through worse, I'm not going to overstate that. My touchstone, I guess, in all of it, all along, is that I'm confident in my own position. I'm, I'm absolutely certain I've done nothing wrong. Therefore, I need to and do trust in the process. And you know, the police are, are doing a job, and therefore I have to have faith that everything they're doing in the process of that is justified and, and I'm going to you know, continue to have faith in, in that and as I say the touchstone is, is the confidence in my own position. The other things and the only other things I, I will say are more about myself. I've learned in these past few months uh, and you know this has been particularly I suppose revealing for me having gone through the whole Covid experience I've found depths of resilience that I didn't know I had and I thought I'd plumbed them over the course of the COVID experience. And I've, I've also learned some things that, you know, maybe I would always have learned in this stage of my life that are just, sort of, you know, the, the importance of, of friendship. You know, there's a, a group of people, my closest friends that have been, you know, utterly indispensable to me in the last few months. I, I probably wouldn't have the, the emotional uh, wherewithal to sit here right now, but for them and what they've, so you, you do, it's, it's, it's not a, an experience I would ever have chosen, obviously, but, you know, even out of the toughest things, I'm finding you, you learn things about yourself and, and you learn things about life. And, you know, that's maybe that's proving that as a politician, I'm still always trying to put the positive spin on things. But, you know, I'll, I'll probably continue to do that. And in those hours when your husband was in the police station, I mean, what was going through your head? What did you do? Oh, I have that? no idea. I was with my mum and dad. Uh, always go back to your mummy and daddy when things get... Um, yeah, but yeah I, look, I can't even remember everything that was going through my head at that point. It was not my, it was not the best day of my life, put it that way. And did you then realise that it would be inevitable that you would be questioned as hmm. well? Um, no, I mean, I thought that was uh, more likely than not. But no, I, look, I, the other thing I've just tried to do and is not second guess this. I'm not in control. <laughs> Perhaps the, for somebody like me, um, having done the jobs I've done, you know, you've just got to recognise sometimes. And you know, I've had experiences like this as First Minister, you're not in control of certain things, so there's no point trying to second guess it. The, you just hold on to that, that thing that, that, that I spoke about, that touchstone of my confidence in, in my own position. And you said you are confident that you've done nothing wrong. Are, are you as confident that your husband is? I, so I, I've answered this question before, and before I answer it again, don't, there is nothing to read one way or another into this. This is a, a serious process, and therefore, in that process, I am not going to speak for anybody other than myself, because I only can speak for myself. And so, in, in not answering that question, that's not to say yes or no, it's I'm speaking for myself, and I will speak for myself. I'm not going to try to speak for anybody else, whether it's my husband or anybody else. But do you talk about it together, or do you have a sort of a, a wall I, and just agree not to talk about it? Well, I, put it this way, I, I think I'm choosing when I can to try to talk about happier things. Has it... I mean, I hate asking this question, but I feel I have to. What effect has it had on your marriage? Uh, my marriage is, uh, is not something anybody should worry about. 
When did you first know of the motorhome? Look, these are, these are questions that are going to the heart of things that the police are looking at. I'm not going to... I, we, we talked to you earlier, I don't want to sit here and, and answer every question if I can't answer that. But where I can't answer it, I'm going to have to. So, you know, I'm not going to get into it. Well, let me put it another way. When did you last visit your mother-in-law? Uh, my mother-in-law's just been admitted to a care home. Um, and, you know, again, I, I haven't visited my mother-in-law as often, perhaps, as I should have done over the last couple of years because of COVID, my work, her work. So, um, you know, maybe that's, uh, maybe that's something that doesn't reflect particularly well on me. Do you... Um consciously look forward, I mean, I suppose the answer is obvious, look forward to the day when all of this is behind you. Or do you <laughs> what do you think? Well, but, uh, <laughs> that's, not, that's not the smartest question ever, if I may say so. I haven't finished it. I haven't finished it. But do you feel that this is something that is, could possibly hang over your life for the next five years? I mean, not just for the next six months or twelve. Well, I, I don't know. Um, so I can't. It's not just that I'm choosing not to answer that question. I can't answer that question. Of course I want it to be over as soon as possible and get on the other side of it. And that will happen one day, but I, I can't tell you when that's going to be for obvious reasons. And do you fear that, however this turns out, whether you're completely... Move on! Yeah. 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 I, I, am going, I am going to move on, but you have to let me do this in my own way and you can judge me afterwards if you like. Um, when, when, when you resigned as First Minister, there was lots of speculation about what you would do next, naturally. Um, job of the UN, something like yeah, that. That was never from me. No, I know, no, I know it wasn't. But you must have given some thought to what you would want to do next. Um, to be honest, not really. I'm, I'm still in Parliament. I intend to see it this parliamentary term. I'm, as we've uh, already touched on, I'm writing a book. I'm thinking that that you know, is, is not uh, an insignificant uh, thing to do. I've got a couple of other you know, ideas that I'm not going to get into just now because they're in a very early stage of other things I might want to do in the writing sense in the future. Um, I've always been a bit of a frustrated writer. That's probably, if I have had an ambition outside of politics, that's probably what it is. All of the other stuff about going to... I mean, I used to have to answer questions about if I would go, if I was in the state on a first ministerial visit, I would get questions when I come back about was I secretly seeing the UN to fix up a job? I, that's been things other people have said about me, and yeah, that's part and parcel of being in the, the kind of role I've been in, but going back to your first or second question to me, why am I doing things like this? It's because every now and again, I want to speak in my voice so that people who want to come and hear it, which is not everybody, can hear things from me, not the things that other people say about me. A lot, I'm not going to put a percentage on it because that would be completely arbitrary, but a lot of what is it said about me, printed about me every single day is rubbish, frankly. So, you know, and the UN job thing falls into that category. How's Hamza Yusuf doing? Very well, excellent in fact. I think he's proving to be a fine First Minister. Um, and I think he'll go on to show what a fine First Minister he is uh, and uh, be in post for a long time. But it's been a very difficult start for him, hasn't it? And I mean, with, with the investigation sort of overshadowing the whole party, and his first hundred days or... So I, I don't... Look, the first thing I should probably say is I'm not objective about these things. I'm, I'm you know, pretty... but well, probably still too close to it all to be objective. I don't think it has... Of course it's been, you know, a, an issue. Um, I don't think it has overshadowed his first period as first minister. I, thought he's, I think he's done a lot of really uh, good stuff. I think he's proven himself to be, as I said, an excellent first minister. Going back to your question though about it's been difficult, and I said this to him uh, just as he was after he'd been elected and just in the days, uh, the day I think, before he took up office, every day as first minister is bloody difficult. I, you know, in eight and a half years, I didn't have an easy day. You have days that are easier than others, but there is no such thing as an easy day. It's a tough job. And he's finding that out, as I found it out when I took over, as my predecessors knew in the course of, of doing the job. And I think he's doing it really well. Um, there will be things 
that he does that I'm sure I don't agree with. There are many more things that he do, does that I will agree with. I'm not going to give a running commentary on it because I don't think that's fair uh, to, to him, but I think he's doing a really good job. How often do you speak? Uh, we don't speak every day. I, we speak periodically. Um, I think I had a text exchange with him last week. Um, I no doubt we'll see him. Parliament's in recess just now. I no doubt see him as as we start to go into the run into Parliament. So I, I don't speak to him every day, I wouldn't. But does he ask your advice? Because it would be only natural for a new First Minister has, to sort of consult you. He's it? asked my advice a couple of times. I've given, I'm, I'm not, I've said this before I stood down. I, I will give advice for what it's worth um, if I'm asked for it. I'm not going to be the kind of uh, predecessor that is constantly there, so, you know, trying to shove it down his throat. He's got to, I, I went through this. You, when you come into a job, you have to find your own feet, you have to find your own way of doing it, you will make mistakes. I made you know, plenty of mistakes over my time as, as First Minister. He will do that, everybody does that, but he's got to learn the job for himself and I think he's making a really good fist of it. There's one question in there, which I, I won't be able to find if I look, uh, from somebody who says, can you ever consider coming back as First Minister in the future? <laughs> you're, I mean, no! <laughs> That's the only way to answer that because otherwise, you know, you'll be reading to her. She was unequivocal. If she was too equivocal in the giving that answer, no. Definitely ever. No. <laughs> oh, there's a bit of chink there. <laughs> <laughs> well, because you, as you said yourself, you are only 53. I mean, perfectly possible in 15 years' time. But in how many years' time did you say? I'll say 15 years' time. When I'm 60, what? 68. Do you know, I, I think there's. I think one of the, the things, I don't, it's just there's something really sad about somebody who's done the kind of job I've done, who then leaves the stage. And okay, you do things like this, and I'm, I'm not leaving the stage in the sense that you're never going to hear from me again. There's plenty of people out there who might wish that was the case. Uh, but this, I just don't want to be the kind of former leader who's always exuding this kind of sense of, oh, I just wish I was back in the job. I've had my time as First Minister. It was the privilege of my life. Nothing I ever do in future will match up to the privilege of being First Minister of the country I love. It was tough. I had a particularly tough set of circumstances, as other leaders did, with COVID at the top of that list. But I've had that time. There are many, many, many things I'm proud of. Of course, it's in the nature of things that there are things I regret. But I've had my time. I'm looking forward to the next phase of my life doing different things. And that actually is something that excites and enthuses me. You said earlier, and I think you said it before, that you're not sure that you know yourself, which I thought was actually quite an interesting thing mm. to say, because I think those of us who reach the age of 50, I, I mean, for me, it was about the age of 50 that I thought, well, I know what I'm good at now, I know what I'm not good at. And it is a time when I think you reflect on life because it's a pretty big milestone. What do you think you are best at, and what do you think are your biggest weaknesses? <laughs> um, what am I best at? Um, I, don't, I, I always hate answering this bit of the, these kind of questions, because I'm, people, well, I say the things people say about me. I'm a good communicator. Whether I'm proving that to be the case today, I don't know. Um, I, I think I'm pretty, good at making decisions, at making tough decisions. I've got a very, very good sense and, you know, sometimes this can be a, a, a disadvantage as well as an advantage. I know what I stand for in, in politics and I think in life, uh, I know what my values are and that helps with making good decisions. I, I think I've always been, maybe because of my background, where I come from, the fact that, you know, I've never really moved very far away from my background, if that makes sense, I, I think I've got a reasonable degree of empathy with what people are dealing with in their their day-to-day -day, uh, lives. My weaknesses, and that's for other people to say, um, I, I get things wrong. Perhaps I, reflecting on being First Minister, perhaps, particularly in the early days of my leadership, maybe I strive too hard to, you know, I don't know, sort of satisfy everybody, and that led maybe to, to not being decisive and bold enough on, on certain things and yeah and other than that I've got, I've got a list of weaknesses as long as my arm um, but, but it's for other people now. yeah can we move on move on to quote something <laughs> from the audience um, <laughs> yeah well, wait, where's your move on now <laughs> Let, let's move on to government credit cards 
Which I, look, I'll be honest, I saw that story and I thought, what a load of old bollocks. Um, because obviously people in government have credit cards and to spend £14 million over, what was it, four years, I'm thinking, is that really the biggest story that they can come up with this week? But it, it's being saying Nicola Sturgeon's credit cards. Well, I didn't even have one, so it's, it's not, you look, I mean, apart from the, the stuff about uh, airport services, none of, I mean, I've, I've, I've got to make a confession here, right, because it's one of the most joyful things in my life at the moment. I don't read the newspapers as much as I had to do previously, so I'm kind of not oblivious, but I'm not as on top of everything that's going on in the world um, as, as I used to be. But from what I've read about this, not, none of the other stuff I've read has anything to do with me personally. And on the airport stuff, you know, a first minister has the ability to travel through an airport quickly and securely. I don't know if that is an outrage. Make up your own mind. I think I saw the £10,000 over, you are saying four years, I don't know what the period was, but a couple of years. That's probably less than one private jet flight of Rishi Sunak. <laughs> um, most of, for any First Minister, probably for any head of government anywhere, a lot of your, all of your travel is informed by security considerations. And, you know, I, all the time I was first minister, and I'm not saying these things should be netted off against each other, this is not the point I'm making, but, you know, being careful with public money, taxpayers, uh, pounds and pennies, of course that's important. I, in no year that I was first minister, did I take my full salary as first minister. When I stood down as first minister, the gap between the salary I took and uh, the salary I was entitled to was about 10% of, of my, all of that uh, difference was donated back to the public purse. So yes, I think these things are really important, but there's something about Scottish politics, you know, is it uniquely Scottish politics? I don't know, but it's particularly the case in Scottish poli politics. Just now, there's just something really kind of lacking in perspective about how we're debating and having these things reported. But There's big, big issues there that perhaps should be getting more coverage than how a First Minister travels through an but, but it all contributes to this idea among many people, and social media exacerbates this, that all politicians have got but, their hand in yeah, the door. Sure. That, that's what it's intended yeah. to do. But that doesn't make it true, no, of course it frankly. Doesn't. And you know, I, I, you could do a quick Google search and I'm sure you would find similar stories about the UK government perhaps with a bit more justification on some things. Um, but you know, why, you know, there's lots of issues around in Scotland that would be absolutely legitimate for scrutiny about, you know, how public money is spent. I'm not denying that that's the case in Scotland, but you know, maybe a bit more coverage about, you know, PPE contracts and the UK government and things like that. But these things are important in terms of scrutiny about how the public's money has been spent. The, the point, I, mean, I think stories like this one actually detract from that because they, they contribute to a sense that you're kind of missing the real point and focusing on things that perhaps are, are being presented in a way that doesn't quite match reality. Do you now have any regrets about the way you handled the gender uh, recognition reform bill? I, I don't have regrets about the way I handled it. I mean, bef and before I come on to that, I, you, you talked about references to Nicola Sturgeon's credit cards and the, the government procurement card story. I frequently uh, see references to Nicola Sturgeon's gender recognition bill. This is a bill that was passed by over, I think, over a two-thirds majority of the Scottish Parliament. There were members of all parties voted for it. So, you know, it's not my policy, it was my government that proposed it. What well, I you have seem a, to be distancing yourself from it by saying... But no, I, I voted for it. I'd voted, vote for it again tomorrow if it came up in, in Parliament. So I'm not distancing myself from it at all. I'm simply making the point. It wasn't something I foisted on the country. It was a, a piece of legislation that the Scottish Parliament overwhelmingly voted for. So just to be clear, I am not in any way distancing myself from it. Do What I regret, and I, I think I referred to this when I uh, announced that I was standing down, I, this is a feature of politics generally just now where everything is so polarised that it becomes so hard to find common ground. Everybody in social media plays its part in this. It's the nature of how we uh, talk to each other, debate with each other. Everybody runs to the extremes of, of an issue. And if I have a regret on gender recognition, 
it was that I didn't manage to kind of get more people into what I think is the, the sensible centre ground of it. Because actually the, 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 the different views that have become so polarised, I don't believe are irreconcilable. I'm a feminist. I've, I've been a feminist all my life. I'll be a feminist till the day I die. I still haven't seen Barbie, as we were talking about, but that's another matter. No I will be a feminist till the day I die. Women's rights matter to me more than you know most other things uh, that we could talk about here. But I also think that what is probably the most stigmatised, vulnerable, discriminated against group in society deserves a better crack at the whip in terms of just being themselves. I don't think these things are ir irreconcilable. So if I've got a regret, it's that I didn't manage to reconcile them a bit more effectively. And th this whole issue, and I, I don't really want to go into the sort of all the whys and wherefores of it, but it, it, it is it is fracturing friendships, isn't it? The, the, the so -called it's not fractured any of uh, my friendships. You sure? Um, well, unless you're about to tell me something. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I, I'm not going to tell you something. But I, I mean, I, I think a lot of people uh, who, you said you, you are a staunch feminist, not a great surprise to anyone, but there are many feminists who do not understand how you as a feminist could pass that legislation. Well, and um, so I, you talked about fracturing friendships, it's not fractured any of my friendships, I, I, and I'm not going to name names here, but I've got two very close friends uh, in particular, um, that are in the kind of small group I spoke about earlier on, who've you know, been amazing uh, with, to me over the last few months in particular, that are, you know, if, if we had to, decide which side of this we're on, they'd probably be on the other side to me. It hasn't fractured our friendship in the slightest because we talk about it and we recognise actually that when we do talk about it, we're not as far apart as it would be suggested that we are. And instead of allowing friendships to be fractured, if more of us could just sit and talk about it, then, and, but that applies in a whole range of different issues. And it's, it's too easy these days to blame social media, Twitter, or whatever it's called now, for all of this. But it, it does play a big part, because in order to send a, a tweet and do that as concisely as you have to do, you have to take the, kind of, the most um, definitive you know, a form of an opinion possible. And that, I think, has encouraged all of us to, to go to the, the polar opposites of, of issues and, and be very sort of black and white about where we stand. Actually, most of us live our lives somewhere in the middle. On most issues, you know, we, we will find things we agree on, things we disagree on. We need to find, as a society, we desperately need to find. Every time I say this, people say, how dare she say that? She's been part of the problem. I recognise that as a politician, particularly on, you know, the constitutional issue, which has defined a lot of Scottish politics. Of course I've been part of that over the last few years. But that also perhaps gives me a perspective now in saying we need to find ways of finding the things we agree on, but being a bit more civilised again about the things we disagree on. It, it's not just that we express ourselves in a very polarised way on particular issues. There's almost this kind of sense that if you disagree with somebody, so if, if, if I disagree with somebody on independence or on the gender recognition thing, then we can't possibly agree on something else. That's not how life is, it's not how people live, and we need to find this civilised common ground again in our politics, or, or frankly, democracy's in, in peril if we don't do that. I, I do worry about the future of, of our democracy, because some of the, the sort of core foundational aspects of it are breaking down, and, and we need to get back to a civilised discourse where we can find things that we agree on and be willing to find things that we agree on, even if we don't think it at the start, but where we disagree, do it in a less bonkers way, a more civilised way. Um, Foster. <laughs> you, you've talked in the past about maybe mm. sort of now would be the time to consider fostering. Have you got further down that road? No, yeah, I, as we've been reflecting on, I've, uh, the last few months have been a bit, uh, yeah, have, had other things, but it's something I certainly haven't ruled out. Um, and but I've also this, I suppose, came about because one of the things I I did as first minister and absolutely got under my skin was spend a lot of time with the care experience 
community. You know, we've got a lot of work underway in Scotland, uh, which Hamza, uh, to his great credit, has really taken forward with, with gusto to improve the lot of young folk who grow up in care of one form or another. And I've met so many young people who've had, frankly, terrible experiences of foster care, but other young people who've had brilliant experiences. And that made me realise, you know, that for a young person who goes into foster care, uh, that can make the difference mm. to them in terms of, of their life chances. Um, so that, I started to think about it. You know, I've not had children of my own and talked a bit about that in the past. But the other thing that the care experienced young people that I've been privileged to spend time with have always instilled into me is that doing something like that, you should never do it to fill a gap in your own life. It shouldn't be something that you're doing for selfish reasons. Fostering a child should be something that you do because you think you can give them something. So it's, it's something I've said I have considered, I'm still considering it, I may well take it further in the future, but I want to make sure I, I think about it properly. Would it be fair to a child, uh, even if I do get to live a bit more privately in the future, to bring a, a child into my kind of life and everything that goes with my life? I want to make sure I was doing it for the right reasons and I've thought about it properly and from the perspective of a child or children that I might foster. Why foster and not adopt? That's a good question, actually. I, I think. God, I've asked one finally. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's 40 minutes. Um, I think all your questions have been good. Um, that, that is a good question. I suppose maybe it's because of the age I am at right now. I, maybe wrongly, I, I kind of thought adoption is maybe not uh, the right choice. But I, I think. Fostering probably more because I think you can probably help more young people and I think there's lots of young people out there who sometimes need temporary care. You know, where possible, children should be with their own parents and we've not been as good as a society, this is true of, of many, many different countries, we've not been as good as we should be and this is one of the things we're trying to change, it's supporting families to stay together. Um, but there will be periods in a family's life where maybe a child needs short-term care with the ultimate ambition of having them back with their parents. So I, I just feel I could probably offer more fostering than adoption. But now, yeah, I, I don't know that I've got a perfect answer to that question. Um, whenever I do these interviews, I never come on stage with any notes or... Sort it's of impressive. Well, but of course the disadvantage of that is if I ask you about a policy area that you've been... Uh, interested in whether you've succeeded or, fa or failed. I haven't got the data in front of me. I love these kind of interviews. So, <laughs> that means I can say what I like. Yeah, exactly. So I want to talk a little bit about the record of your government. I mean, ultimately, you failed, didn't you? Because you haven't secured an independence referendum or secured independence. And that is obviously at the heart of the SNP. It's at the heart of what you must have wanted to achieve from day one. So, yeah, I would love to have... Uh, taken Scotland to independence. Um, so, yeah, I, that's one of the regrets I have that I, as leader, didn't manage to do that. I suppose that's balanced by the fact I've, I've campaigned for independence literally all of my life. Achieving it is more important to me than the question of who is leader when it is achieved. Uh, and, and so, you know, I, I believe Scotland will become independent. I think Scotland will become independent sooner rather than later. Um, but I regret not being able to take it further. One of my reasons for stepping down was that I thought I possibly had taken it as far as, as I could. But there's, there's something here that, without trying to sort of shift the, the focus of, of this discussion, we need to be re really, really clear about. The, the fact that Scotland is not yet independent, the fact that I didn't secure another referendum, is not because I didn't try hard enough, it's not because you know, me or my government didn't, you know, believe it strongly enough. The reason is because we face a Westminster government, actually a Westminster establishment, because Labour, to its great shame, is in the same position now, that refused to recognise Scottish democracy, that refused to recognise election result after election result, where a party advocating a referendum won the election. And unfortunately, they hold the legal 
power. So that's what we're up against. And, yes. and the way to overcome that is only by people power. Um, and that's why I think at some point it's got to be put front and centre of an election so that people are crystal clear what the SNP is asking people to vote for. And then we've got to demonstrate beyond doubt why it's not an abstraction, it's not a distraction, it's absolutely fundamental to the issues that people are grappling with. But that strategy of saying, well, the next election would be effectively a referendum on independence, that has actually caused a bit of a split in the SNP, hasn't it? Because there are many people who don't think that's the right way to it's do called, it. That, that is also called democracy. You know, I, I spent a lot of my leadership being told wrongly that you know, the SNP wasn't an internal democracy, that it just had to do what I said. You know, of course there's a debate. We're, we're in this position where you know, we've got democracy on our side. We've won. I was, SNP leader for eight years. We won eight elections in my time as, as leader. Uh, all of them, certainly all of the, the parliamentary elections, saying we intended to have another referendum. We've got democracy on our side. We're up against an establishment at Westminster that is blocking that. But so so is Alex Salmond, and he achieved it. That, that makes him a better, have a better record than you, surely. Well, we've got a referendum then. Actually, at the risk of uh, allowing history to be rewritten, David Cameron, and I, I remember this vividly, actually, I was like, with Alec, actually, at the time, David Cameron, it was on an Andrew Marr interview, said, uh, came out and said, I'm going to basically call their bluff and allow them to have a... He thought he was calling our bluff, he thought it was all going to you know, backfire on us by saying that, and then, of course, it came a lot closer than he ever thought it, it would. But it was always going to be, after one referendum, when we scared the bejesus out of the Westminster establishment by coming so close to winning independence, of course it was always going to be more difficult to then say, have them say, oh yeah, we're going to let you do that all over again. So that's what we face. There's no, there's no point in pretending there's some magic answer to that. The answer is people power, and, and it is about putting it front and centre and saying if you want a referendum, you've got to come out and vote for it in, so, in such huge numbers that nobody can deny democracy. Um, and, you know, I, I believe that the, the current impasse at some stage will be broken because it's got to be. Um, and when the next time of asking comes, Scotland will vote to be independent because we've seen over the last few years uh, what happens when we're not independent. We get dragged out of Europe. We have, you know, prime ministers in office for, what, five minutes but still crashing the economy that people are still paying the price of in their mortgages and cost of living crisis, Scotland needs to be independent so that we're in charge of our own destiny and actually in charge of deciding our place in the world, which is an outward looking, welcoming country that doesn't demonise migrants and refugees <laughs> into their place, but opens our doors, grows our population and becomes as successful as all of these other small, independent countries that are all across Europe. So yeah, Scotland is going to be independent but because the Westminster establishment knows that, they're going to do everything in their power to stop us ever getting the chance to have our say. So we're going to have to take uh, the power into our own hands at an election and make it utterly irresistible. Do you, do you think that if we, if we sometime in the future, the, a, a Westminster government, whatever colour, said, well, we recognise that you deserve to have a referendum, there is a mandate, we, we get that, but you've got to get 60% of the vote to become independent on the basis that it's a big constitutional change. Now, I know the Brexit referendum didn't have that, and it wasn't really a debate at the time, but it what did happen in the 79 referendum, didn't it? There was, there was a sort of... Yeah, they, they, they tried to rig it in that referendum. Yeah, why should they allow them to rig Scottish democracy? Why should we accept a premise that goes from Westminster denying Scottish democracy to Westminster rigging Scottish democracy? <laughs> It's outrageous. So 50% plus one vote, you're perfectly happy well, with for a major constitutional change. But that, that's how referendums work, I think, almost in every other country in the world. It's how referendums have always worked here. Would I want to get more than that in the next referendum? Do I think we will get more than that in the next referendum? Yes, but for goodness sake, at some point, Scottish democracy has to count for something. And we should not allow this to sort of just gradually go from blocking it to rigging it. Let the people of Scotland decide. And if the Westminster establishment, those who, you know, perfectly legitimately in Scotland as well as at Westminster, think independence is not the right future for Scotland, that's a, a respectable, obviously legitimate position to have, well, put it to the people. What are you scared of? Because every 
day that passes where people want to block Scottish democracy, all they do is succeed in demonstrating how terrified they are of the verdicts of the Scottish people. The only people that have got a right to decide Scotland's future are the people who live here in Scotland. Incidentally, regardless of where they come from, if you live in Scotland, it's us that have the right to decide what the future of this country is. A lot of people think, though, that your resignation has put back the cause of Scottish independence by a long time. Well, some people think my leadership did that. Others think my resignation well, did that. Some people well, managed to think both of those things at the same but, time. But if you, if you look at the poll, I mean, there's one out today that shows sort of 50-50, but there, there was a dip, wasn't there? And certainly there's been a big dip in support for the SNP. Well, the SNP is still ahead in the polls. The SNP is electorally undefeated. Um, in all my time in, as leader, and actually going back, I think the last election the SNP lost was, or didn't win in Scotland, was the 2010 general election, if I'm correct, in that we are ahead in the polls, 16 years into government. One of the things I, and I'm going to make myself sound old here, um, and I'm not that old as we've reflected on, but when I started out in Paul, I remember my first ever SNP meeting I went to, I was 17, 16, 17, at the time, and there was great jubilation in the room that night because back in those days there was a monthly opinion poll with the Glasgow Herald, it was a system three opinion poll, and the great jubilation in the room was because the SNP for the first time in months, if not longer, had gone into double figures in the polls. And that, I say that because that gives you a sense of how far we've travelled, and one of the things I think sometimes reflect on is that our successes came partly because the generation that I'm part of got stronger through the losses and the tough times. All parties, all governments have good times and bad times. They have ups and downs. The SNP is going through a relatively difficult time right now, although, you know, actually, when you take a step back, it's, it's not that bad. Maybe over the last, you know, almost two decades now, we've just made it look a bit too easy. Winning elections is not easy. It shouldn't be easy. So, you know, if the SNP is having a slightly tougher time, well, that will make us stronger for the, for the future. But, you know, 16 years into government, still to be ahead in the opinion polls, and I don't think many people would bet against us winning the next Scottish election as well, I certainly uh, wouldn't, then that's a pretty good position, and we should just reflect on the fact that past generations in the SNP would have given their eye teeth for a fraction of the advantages and strength of position that we have right now. So a bit of perspective in politics sometimes is really, really important. Um, before we go into questions, what, what is the one thing that you look back on your time as First Minister and think, that's something that wouldn't have happened had I not been here? So I'm, I'm not, I I'm suppose I'm asking for your proudest achievement, but can you pick out one? Well, what, I mean, there's lots and lots, but you, every um, family, uh, low-income family in Scotland right now, only country in the UK where this is the reality, uh, through the Scottish child payment gets 25 quid a week for every child. Um, lifting children out of poverty, giving children a better start in life. I'm really proud of that and it wouldn't have happened if I hadn't been First Minister and no other part of the UK has a policy, even where Labour is in government in, in Wales. So that's just one thing that I'm incredibly proud of, of many things that I'm proud of. Do I have regrets? Of course I have regrets but I've got many more things that I'm proud of than things I regret. What, what do you think, <laughs> apart from failing to get an independence referendum, what do you look back on and think, well, that really was a failure? The ferries, drug deaths? I could go on um, that way. Yeah, I'm sure you could go on for that long. Um, look, yes, of course, the ferries. Um, uh, and with it, I could probably sit here for the rest of the interview and talk about some of the reasons behind that. But of course, that is, you know, something that should not um, have happened, and I obviously deeply regret that. Drug deaths is more complex. I, I regret every uh, death from drugs or alcohol, uh, but it's more complex than that in terms of some of the drivers and some of the solutions. I think we are now um, will take time on the the right track. Something that, just to go from drug deaths to a similar, not the same issue, you know, people who suffer poor health or, or die through alcohol issues. Something else I'm really, really proud of is becoming the first country in the world to introduce minimum price 
uh, for alcohol, something that the studies already show is saving lives in Scotland every year, something that no other government, not just in the UK, but anywhere in the world, hadn't had the courage to do. Uh, so yes, there are things that I grappled with as First Minister, things I didn't manage to solve as First Minister, but we did things that were actually getting a grip of some really difficult and tractable problems um, that I think we were right to do, and I think history will show that we were right to do these things. But just going back to drug deaths, so over the years, I mean, there was a dip in one year, but it's gone up again in the, in the last year. I mean, what, what do you put this down to, that it's not just worse than any other country in the United Kingdom, but also in the whole of Europe? So the, the reason I said it's complex was not trying to dodge it. It is complex. You know, I grew up in my uh, teenage years in the 1980s. Uh, a lot of the, the, the drugs problem here goes back to people who you know, would have started taking drugs when I was young, multiple health problems, it's complex in that sense. I don't think we've had the right interventions. I, I think we have too often treated drug misuse as a, a criminal justice issue, not as a public health issue, and therefore that makes it more difficult to get the right type of support. I think we have not done the right things in terms of uh, prevention, but more particularly, quick and uh, easy access to treatment options. So yeah, these things we have not got right uh, and I make no bones about that. I think we are getting them right now and there will be you know, work that we still need to do. Uh, there are th some things, and I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm only saying this as an example, I'm not trying to say it's the whole issue here, but there are some things that we want to do that we can't do because power doesn't lie in Scotland. So uh, the issue of, of having uh, assisted uh, treatment centres that we can't do at our own hand that would make um, a, a big difference. So there's lots of different things. It's a complex problem, but the position is not acceptable and I wouldn't suggest otherwise. Right, let's move on to some questions. Um, Adam says, in light of Alex Salmon's recent comments on this stage about his hope for reconciliation with yourself, is there any hope? Now I did say to him what you said here last year when I asked you the question about if you could ever foresee a situation where you could become friends again, and you just said, no. Um, he, I then said to him, well, if you were both in 20 years' time in the uh, SNP Twilight Home for the Bewildered or something. Like that. <laughs> and I said, and he encountered you, what would he say? And first of all, he said, nurse. <laughs> Can I go there first? But, but then he did. Um, he did say, well, he, he'd quite like it if it ha could happen in the future. Yeah, well, I didn't hear what he said. I'm, I, I would be very surprised if he meant it. Um, <laughs> um, what I'm about to say really doesn't come from a place of anger. Certainly not anymore. Maybe in the last few years, uh, at different times, this would have been different. It, it doesn't come from a place of anger. It, it maybe comes from more a place of indifference, actually, than, than anger. I don't foresee that, and it's not something I, I want. I was very close to Alec for a long, long time. We achieved great things together, and I'll always be proud of that. And I'm not, in this, you know, coming to think of it, writing a book and everything, I, I don't, I'm not trying to rewrite history here, but over recent years, I don't know, he's revealed himself to be somebody that I, I don't want to have in my life. I, I don't particularly want to, have a relationship with. I, I don't judge anybody who takes a different view, but you know, we don't have long on this planet. We've got a limited amount of time to spend with people. I want to spend the time I have with people who make me happy and who I like and who I enjoy spending time with. And, and that, as I say, it doesn't come from a place of anger anymore. I've gone through the whole spectrum of emotions with Alec over the last few years, and I'm now at a place where, yeah, I just, you know, there are other people I'd rather spend time with. This one made me laugh, so that's why I'm going to ask, ask it. I support, this is from Joanna in Fife. I support independence, my husband doesn't. How do I convince him to change his mind? <laughs> for your information, I've been married for 28 years, so that doesn't work anymore. <laughs> versions of that. <laughs> <laughs> Try something different, maybe. I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is from uh, Mark. 
Was there any discussion with Theresa May to go uh, to get Brexit done with Scotland remaining in the single market? Oh, I tried uh, to. I, I was never in a, a place of wanting to help get Brexit done. I, I hated Brexit and still hate it, uh, the very idea of it and everything that it's, it's uh, made since. But I tried very hard to persuade her uh, to allow Scotland to have I mean, effectively the kind of relationship Northern Ireland has. Now, okay, Northern Ireland's got it for different reasons, and I don't grudge Northern Ireland uh, that. The issues at stake there are, are too important, but we could have had a similar arrangement, and she wouldn't countenance it. And, you know, there, there are many, many arguments for Scotland being independent, but in recent years, Brexit has to be the strongest and clearest argument. We, by a massive majority, wanted to stay in the European Union and got dragged out, and then we don't even get the ability um, to try to find a compromise that mitigates the impact on our economy and, and society. So, yeah, I did my best with Theresa May, um, but it, yeah, it didn't work. When you were on the stage last year, we talked a lot about, or you, you had some really funny anecdotes about dealing with Theresa May and Boris Johnson. Of course, since then, we've had two more Prime Ministers. Yeah, I've, I've, I've now got to keep the anecdotes from my book. <laughs> I can't tell you at all. Nobody wants their money back now. <laughs> Go on, let's trust. There must be something. <laughs> I'm sorry, wait. I, there wasn't time to have anecdotes with Liz Truss. Um, I, I didn't have a formal meeting with her when as she was, but we, we did, um, so I'll, I'll not be too jocular about this. We had some interactions around about Tim Queen died, obviously. Um, and she was Prime Minister, but there wasn't time to have an actual sit-down meeting. She wasn't in the job long enough. So I, I'm afraid I don't have that many anecdotes about her. Don't have any. It, it, uh, okay. Now, that's an anecdote in itself. <laughs> <laughs> there was one that caught, which I think I told you about last year when we had the interaction over yeah. which of us had been in vogue and which of us hadn't. <laughs> Rish, Rishi Sunak, it strikes me, has actually made an effort to be more conciliatory with you and with, with your successor. Am I right in that? Um, yeah, I think that's fair. But, and I, I had this conversation with him directly when we, we had dinner up in Inverness, I think towards the, no, I think at the start of this year actually. Um, the, the effort is good and given what went before, appreciated and you know, I've given credit for that, but a good relationship involves more than just ticking the box of you know having a meeting or sitting down for for dinner there has to be a genuine respect and a, a genuine understanding of each other's position and, and at times a, a willingness to accept different positions and that's what still i think is is lacking we have a so you've got rishi sunak trying to be you know on the face of it more respectful towards the scottish government and to me and now my successor but underneath that, you've got the most aggressively anti-devolution uh, Westminster government that we've had in the whole lifetime of, of devolution. Overriding, you know, I know the GRR bill is controversial, but it was passed by a majority, significant majority of the Scottish Parliament, and they're using a never before used power to effectively veto it. You've got powers being eroded and undermined all, so that's what matters. You can be, you can do all that with a smile on your face, but it doesn't change the fact that that's what you're doing, undermining the Scottish Parliament and eroding uh, the powers of a Parliament that people in Scotland voted but for. But the power, I mean, the power was there in law to be used in circumstances where a law passed by the Scottish Parliament would have consequences for the rest of the United well, Kingdom. Yeah, but it's clear it, that would be the case. Well, well I'm sorry, Ian, but it's not clear that a, a, a bill that is about what happens in Scotland has significant consequences for the rest of the UK. That's going to be, obviously there's a judicial review coming up on that, so a, a court is going to look at that and decide. But you know, what, what we, th there's another uh, provision in the, the devolution settlement that was called the Sewell Convention after Lord Sewell at the time, but is formally known as the Legislative Consent Mechanism, which is where if Westminster wants to legislate in something that is within the devolved power of the Scottish Parliament, they have to get the consent of the Scottish Parliament. That was respected for, I think, the first 20 years uh, of the, the life of the Scottish Parliament. And then, over Brexit, 
they decided to override that. And at the time they did it, it was like, oh, it's a one-off, it's a, an exceptional circumstance. But once they've done it once, our experience has been they've now done that several times. So that, that convention is now you know, not worth the paper it's written on because they just do what they want. And that, with this Section 35 power that they've used over the GRR, never been used before. They're trying to say, oh, well, you know, it's exceptional, except it's not. I would predict if we don't get to the position where this is not possible to do, that will be used more and more as well, because you've got a Westminster government now that does not respect devolution, that does not respect the Scottish Parliament, that is going to assert whatever power it's got to, uh, frankly, stymie Scottish democracy. That's the reality we now have, and actually the only way to resolve that properly for the long term is to take that power away from Westminster governments and bring it to Scotland, and that means being independent, and then we have a relationship of equals. Good relationship, I would predict and hope, but one of equals. That's the essence of Scotland being independent, so we can't have our decisions uh, overridden by Westminster governments whenever they feel like it. Um. If you weren't a politician, what career do you think you would have liked to pursue? So, when I was a wee girl, um, I never thought of being a politician. It wasn't something that, you know, there wasn't a Scottish Parliament until I was in my late 20s. Uh, so that wasn't really something I wanted to do. When I was a wee girl, uh, I had just lost my uncle. I was very close to last week, it was his funeral yesterday, he was a journalist. Um, so. He was a big influence in my life, and so journalism was maybe in there, but I don't think I was ever serious about that. I wanted to be a lawyer since I was about five, before I knew what a lawyer was, probably. I became a lawyer. Um, the other thing I always wanted to do uh, was write. Back, I think because I was a child, I always assumed it would be children's books that I would write. I always wanted to write books, and maybe that's what I will do for the rest of my life. Um, this is from Phil, a proud Welshman. Uh, does Wales have the infrastructure and ability to become independent? We've got Mark Drakeford uh, on this, well not on this stage, in another room in this building at four o'clock, so be careful what you say. I, look, not, you'll never hear me say anything critical of Mark Drakeford, he's one of my favourite people and I had a great working relationship with him, he's you know, a fine First Minister of, of Wales and actually Scottish Labour could learn so much from Welsh Labour um, about how to be proud. Of, and, and stand up for devolution, stand up for, you know, Mark Drakeford stands up for uh, Welsh democracy, stands up for the Welsh Assembly, calls out what I've just been talking about in terms of Westminster behaviour in a way that Scottish Labour just never finds the ability uh, to do. Does Wales have the ability to be independent? Of course it does. Mark and I take different views on this. Mark is not in favour of of Welsh independence and ultimately it's up to Wales to decide just as it is up to Scotland to decide it for Scotland it's up to Wales but if Wales decided it wanted to be independent then of course it has well, what it Why have Clyde never broken through in Wales in the way that the SNP? If, if we were sitting here 20 years ago the same question would have been asked of, of the SNP. It, you know, maybe the, the debate around so support for Welsh independence is higher than it's ever been before I think. Um, it's not as high as support for Scottish independence is, you know, maybe the, the debate in Wales is, is just tracking a bit behind the debate in Scotland. I suspect if Scotland, when Scotland becomes independent, I would predict that Wales will not be far behind because the position for Wales then, uh, because so often in these debates, Wales and Scotland, Northern Ireland obviously without a government in place just now more complicated, but our only sort of uh, you know, ballast against Westminster behaviour is the solidarity we show with, with each other. For Wales within the Westminster system without Scotland there, that would be even harder. So I, I think the UK, you know, the British Isles, you know, as First Minister, I've gone to, uh, you know, many British Isles uh, summit, British Irish Council summits uh, in the, the past. The British Isles will always be, you know, a, a collection of nations that have a very close relationship but I think in future it will not be the form that we have just now of the United Kingdom. It will be a different form and actually a far healthier and better and more constructive form of relationship than the one we have right now. Will the SNP be responsible for a Labour victory in next year's election, i.e. will Labour take SNP seats? Uh, no, I don't think they will. Um, oh, come on. 
I mean, you, you don't have to be too imaginative to work out in some of the seats that I mean, you are going to lose some. You have to accept I'm that. I'm sorry, no, why do I have to accept that? We're, we're not but even in the election. I've been here. I've been here. reality. I've spent my life being told that the SNP was, you know, for a long time, we did lose elections. And then, you know, but every, I fought three general elections um, as SM, UK general elections as SNP leader. We won all three of them. And so, yeah, seats will be competitive and we'll fight them, but why would I sit here right now and accept that my party's going to lose seats? I'm not, because we'll be fighting hard to, to hold seats and to, to win seats. I think we'll win seats off the Tories in Scotland uh, as well, incidentally, in the general election. So, you know, Labour, I know, it, I know it's fashionable in some circumstances to blame the SNP for everything, um, but, you know, the only party that has any responsibility for Labour's fortunes, uh, whether they're good or bad, is Labour. And what I'd say right now about Labour is, you yeah, I spent my life opposing Tory governments. I don't think Tories have ever done anything good for, for Scotland. But what's the point in a Labour party that is just a pale imitation of the Conservatives? Every time you hear Keir Starmer open his mouth right now, it seems to be to be at pains to agree with what the Tories are doing or to sort of reduce the difference between them. You've got to stand for something in politics. Um, what's the point of you? So find some backbone would be my message to Chris Stanley. Thank you. I think all the journalists in the audience looked up at that point. <laughs> um, right, this is from, I think we're nearly at the end of our time. One more question, Kia says, here. <laughs> <laughs> Where do I get a backbone? Genuinely. <laughs> How do you keep your patience when interviewed by the BBC? I don't know what this I got against the BBC. BBC reporters when they ask questions you've already answered. Um, I, I've not been interviewed by the BBC for a while well, actually, which is probably better for my state of mind. Um, I don't, I don't want to sing out the BBC. It, uh, obviously, we had the, the horrible news yesterday about Glenn Campbell from the BBC's health problems. I take the opportunity to send my, my best wishes and, and hope for a, a full and speedy recovery to him. Look, the, the, the job of the media is to you know, scrutinise people like me, hold us to account, make us feel you know, irritated and frustrated with questions. Um, and I go through many, have gone through many interviews where, yeah, you're, you're struggling to sort of keep your patience, not lose your temper. Sometimes I've, su I've succeeded more than uh, others. But if that wasn't the case with a senior politician, the media wouldn't be doing their job properly. And that's in the nature of democracy. And frankly, it's a good thing. And it's something we should be, uh, however irritating it is for politicians and political activists, it's something we should be very grateful that we have in this country. I got a lot of flack last year for saying on Twitter after this similar event, that you were one of the most impressive politicians that I'd ever interviewed. Did I retweet you? <laughs> Possibly, and that may, have, that may have brought even further abuse on me. <laughs> Who's the most impressive person you've ever been interviewed by, present company accepted? Oh, well, <laughs> well that, that, yeah, that's a really uh, good question, actually. Um, I've been interviewed by different interviewers of different styles. Uh, but do you like aggressive interviewers? Uh, some of the so, so, do. so do you know the interviews, and I'm going to be really, yes I do, I, I like interviews, uh, or likes, because I don't intend to do many of these in the future, um, I liked interviews that kind of got me going, because I think you, not in an aggressive or overly assertive way, but made me, had me on my toes basically. The interviews I most enjoyed would tend to be, maybe it's because it was first thing in the morning, uh, the GMB interviews with Piers Morgan. Because they always kind of, they, they made me... Stop groaning. I know. <laughs> That's not the same thing as saying I like Piers Morgan, by the way. It's just for the point. I don't have any... Uh, any I'll stop talking now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is what I always do in interviews. I, I kind of start down a road and then I realise I'm just leading myself into a lot of trouble. <laughs> and I think I was doing that there. Um, there's some crap interviews out there, and I'm not going to name names there, but most interviews are going to just have different styles. Um, Ryan Taylor, who used to be the political editor of BBC Scotland, was a, was a fantastic interviewer because he would always try to avoid the kind of gotcha questions. 
tried to get a bit more into the substance and, and probably got more. So that, I, I think if I had to sum up a style I like most, and this goes completely against what I said with Piers Morgan, because he was very much the kind of gotcha uh, type of interviewer. It's the interview that tries to get underneath the headline, un or underneath the easy headline, the easy soundbite, and actually explore an issue where you get a bit of time to talk as well as be held to account. Well, as if by magic, Brian Taylor and John Curtis will be on this very stage on Sunday lunchtime, ladies and gentlemen. But only a few tickets left for that one, so... Uh, do Who's your top selling guest so far? <laughs> Oh, yeah. You should have seen her face when I told her that behind, behind the stage. <laughs> I've beaten Penny Mordaunt. <laughs> make, make it more challenging. <laughs> Listen, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you so much for coming back for Thank the you. third time. Glutton for punishment. I, I, you can tell by the audience that it's a very... I, when I got this pile of questions earlier on, I flicked through them and I thought... This is not an anti Nicola Sturgeon audience. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you very much indeed for coming and thank you to thank Nicola. You. Thank you.